أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله سبحانه وتعالى in ayah number 86 of surah At-Tawbah he says and when a surah is sent down saying believe in God and strive with his messenger the affluent among them ask you for leave and say let us be among those who stay behind this passage and the verses that we're going to cover it returns to the theme of a group among the companions of the holy prophet who desired to stay back while the holy prophet led the mu'mineen on their military expedition to tabuk now when the ayah says وَإِذَا أُنزِلَتْ سُورَةٌ And when a surah is sent down saying آمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَجَاهِدُوا مَعَ رَسُولِهِ Believe in God and strive alongside the messenger. The surah here is a reference to Surah At-Tawbah because one of the, the primary themes of this surah is reminding the believers to have faith in God and having faith in God also has to manifest itself through struggling and striving alongside the messenger. So when a surah is sent down, the surah here is in reference to Surah At-Tawbah, the present surah that we're examining. Now, when the ayah says, وَجَاهِدُوا مَعَ رَسُولِ believe in, When a surah is sent down saying, believe in God and strive with his messenger. مَعَ here means that it's in reference to the idea that you have to go out you have to join him in battle it's not enough for you to to make you know a financial contribution it's not enough to say that we're with you in spirit that you have to strive alongside him so strive with the prophet with the messenger is understood to mean that the believers go out with him that when he leaves medina when he advances towards Tabuk that they join him in the battlefield they're with him in in spirit and they're physically with him and aminu billahi wa jahidu ma'a rasuli istadhanaka ulu tawli minhum this surah is exhorting the companions of the prophet to believe in god to have true faith and to strive with the messenger now the affluent among them some of the sahaba were very wealthy they were very rich when this surah was revealed and they're being commanded to join the prophet some of them and the quran here mentions ulul you know the people who have money the people who have wealth and you see brothers and sisters if you look at the the history of prophets most of the time the majority of the supporters and the followers of the ancient prophets have been the less fortunate have been the poor the destitute because what happens is that wealthy people people of affluence in their minds they have a lot to lose and therefore they're they're much they're they're less willing to take risk because they have a lot of assets they have a lot of money so when a surah is sent down saying believe in god and strive with his messenger the affluent among them ask you so these rich sahaba these wealthy companions they come to the prophet and they want the prophet to give them permission to stay that they ask you for mission for permission and they say to you let us be among those who stay back now who are those who stay back those who are not required to participate in jihad you know women children the elderly the sick so they don't want to go they make excuses you know some of them may have said to the prophet that ya rasulullah who's going to look after the women and the children you know the prophet is telling them join me we have to go to tabuk they refuse to join the prophet and they're they're making recommendations to the prophet that it's better if we stay you see brothers and sisters 
there are some among the companions who disobey the Prophet and who believe that they are in a position to make recommendations to the Prophet that let us stay behind it's better if we stay behind Dharna, leave us we will be with those who remain behind now this is what they say you know they're they're presenting what they believe is a valid excuse so this is what is observable so you see these rich companions these wealthy companions asking the prophet permission to stay behind allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next verse he reveals something that's hidden so them asking for permission from the prophet saying to the prophet let us stay behind with those who are staying back you know pardon us from joining excuse us from joining but then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next verse he speaks about what is in their hearts and in many cases what is on the tongue is not a re not a reflection of what is in the hearts they are presenting an excuse to the prophet Ayah number 87 الخوالف, the, the problem is not that they just ask for permission to stay you know someone who asks the prophet or the imams for permission to be exempt from religious religious obligation maybe they believe that it was actually better for them to stay maybe they they were mistaken into thinking that they had a religious justification but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here he says they are content to be among those who remain behind they're happy to stay behind it makes them happy that they don't have to join you they are content to be among those who remain behind and a seal is set upon their hearts so they do not understand now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many verses in the Quran he speaks about this idea of placing a seal on the heart this when this happens brothers and sisters this is a very dangerous state for the human being to enter because we know brothers and sisters that when a, when a person commits sin there is always an opportunity for that person to rectify himself that all sins are forgivable and the nur of the fitra will always be there as long as that person has a conscience but here the question is you know many people commit sins why is it that with these with this group allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places a seal on their hearts you may ask what what happened to the mercy of god why was the seal placed on their hearts so they disobeyed the prophet there are many who disobey the prophet there are many people many companions who d disobeyed the messenger why are these individuals condemned and why is the seal placed on their hearts the answer is brothers and sisters you know when people sin there are some people who sin and they have remorse you commit a sin and you feel regret you feel guilt and there are others who sin persistently they sin over and over and over but they still feel bad about it you know there are some people they have bad habits they're addicted to certain sins they sin persistently but they still have a little bit of guilt in them but when does it become dangerous and for those people there's still the opportunity of toba they still have a chance to repent when does a sin become lethal for the soul when does a sin introduce a a terminal spiritual illness whereby the soul the heart becomes sealed meaning it, it there's no more nur that can enter the heart it becomes sealed it's no longer receptive to the divine message 
The answer is when it starts to enjoy sinning. You know, as I said, sometimes you sin and you feel guilty. Sometimes you sin persistently over and over, but there's still a little bit of guilt. You feel bad about it. You have an nafsul lawama, the self-accusing soul. But then you sin so much that you start to enjoy it. During the sin and even after the sin, there's no more remorse. You're content. You're happy. You are enjoying sin. And this is precisely why Allah Azza wa Jal has condemned them. The moment the human soul begins to enjoy sin during the act and even after, after the act, and there's no remorse, there's no regret, there's no shame, there's no guilt, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places a seal on the heart. This is you know, what we call the, the point of no return. This is when the light of the fitrah, even that initial light that allows the human being to be inclined towards goodness, even that light of the fitrah becomes extinguished. A seal is set on their hearts. What happens when that seal is set on the hearts? Yes, they can physically hear, they can they're able to physically see their eye, their eyesight and their ability to hear is intact, but their spiritual, the, the, the eye of the heart can no longer see. They are spiritually deaf and blind, and therefore they, they don't understand. They're not able to comprehend truth. They can't comprehend these religious truths. So taking pleasure in sin is, is really the theme of this verse. That these are some of the companions of the Prophet who, from an outside observer, would think that, oh, you know, maybe, maybe they really feel that it's better. Maybe they, you know, they're asking for permission because they're afraid, but they wish they could join. You know, because sometimes believers might be afraid. You know, they might they might have cowardly traits, they might not have that courage, but they still feel bad. They they feel bad, they feel ashamed that. They didn't have the courage and the bravery to join. But these individuals know. Allah says, They were content. They were happy. They were pleased to be left behind. So taking pleasure in sin is something that we have to be conscious of. We have to be very wary of reaching that level of rebellion. And there are many ahadith from the Ahlul Bayt السلام, warning warning us about the danger of finding pleasure in sin there's a a narration from our fourth imam al imam ali ibn al hussein zain al abidin salawatullahi alayhi where the imam says wal i warn you be very careful of taking pleasure in sinning Listen to what the Imam says. He says, taking pleasure in sin, the attitude that you have while you're sinning, taking pleasure in the sin is worse than the sin itself. It's worse. To be in a state where, you're, where you enjoy it, where you don't have any guilt, you have no remorse, no shame. That is actually worse than the sin itself. In a, in a hadith from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wassalam, he says, إِذَا أَذْنَبَ الرَّجُلِ And this is why it's important for us not to become persistent in our sins. Because when, you, when sinning becomes habitual and chronic, it could eventually reach a point where you enjoy sinning and you no, you no longer feel any remorse or guilt. So that's why if you notice certain behaviors in yourself, if you notice there are certain sins that you're committing on a regular basis, you need to take a firm, you need to take a very strong stand against yourself. Perhaps you need to set punishments for yourself. So for example, make a nadh, make an oath 
that if you commit a certain sin, that if you look at a non-mahram with lust, for example, that every time you do it, you'll pay $200 in charity. So make it religiously binding on yourself that I, I, I swear by God that if I look at a non-mahram with lustful eyes, I will pay $200 in charity. Or I will fast for three days or I'll fast for 10 days. It becomes religiously binding for you to do that. So perhaps if you, if you, if you threaten your soul with these punishments, you'll be able to curb some of these bad habits. So Imam al-Sadiq, he says, when a, human, when a person sins, the Imam السلام, he's illustrating, a, he's giving an example for us so we can understand how the soul, how the heart responds to sinning. The Imam says, when a person sins, there is a black dot that appears on their heart. There is a type of darkness that enters the heart. فَإِنْ تَابًا مَحَتْ If a person repents, that darkness is removed. That darkness is removed. وَإِنْ زَادَ زَادَتْ But if that person doesn't repent and continues to sin, that darkness becomes to, it starts to increase. So every human being has light, has nur in their heart. When you sin, you're introducing darkness. You're reducing that light. And the more you sin, what happens? Imam al Sadiq says when a person sins consistently and persists in sinning, the heart becomes engulfed in darkness. You know, so if you picture, so if you if you imagine that the qalb is a room full of candles, every time you sin, you blow out one of those candles, and then you blow out another one, and another one, and another one, and what eventually happens? You blow out the last candle, which is what? The candle of your fitrah, your natural disposition towards goodness. One, when that candle is blown out, what happens? The entire room is dark. The entire heart becomes engulfed in darkness. And then the Imam says, فَلَا يُفْلِحُ بَعْدَهَا أَبَدًا When that happens, you will never prosper. That when, when the light of the fitrah becomes erased, this is when the individual is, is doomed. Unless, of course, Allah Azza wa Jal intervenes or something something uh supernatural or extraordinary takes place but that is the the uh the the normative uh consequence رَسُولُ so allah here so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about some of the companions who sought permission from the Prophet to stay behind. And what made that such a serious sin was the fact that they were disobeying the Messenger. They were refusing to support him. They were sinning and they were content with their rebelliousness. They were taking pleasure in sinning. Yeah, so uh, Shaykh, it's on the, regarding the seal on the heart, it seems like Allah takes credit for a lot of actions, including things like natural occurrences, like falling rain, and this is a uh, and placing seals on people's heart. But for other actions that are attributed to people, uh, it often uh, it seems like in the Quran those are attributed to the person themselves that they the person did this action, the person did that action. Um, what is special about um, something like placing a seal on the heart that Allah is taking credit for this action? So if you so you're talking number eighty seven. Yes. So in, in this particular verse, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala doesn't mention who is placing the seal. So because it's a it's a it's a verb where it's a the, the fa'al is majhul. So wa it then and a seal is set. Upon their hearts. Now, in other in other verses, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, 
uh, he's, he ascribes the action of placing the seal to himself. In Surah Al-Baqarah, for example. Now, why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attributes it to himself? Now, of course, Allah has given the human being free will. So a person has the, uh, he has the free will to choose to obey or disobey. But the act of sealing, God attributes it to himself. One of the reasons that the Mufassirin mention is that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this system where persistent sinning and taking pleasure in sin results, the natural result of that is for the heart to become sealed or engulfed in darkness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attributes it to himself because he's the creator of this system of cause and effect. And also one could say that, that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the authority to condemn and to speak with authority about what's happening to the heart of the human being. That only God is pervy to that knowledge. So for example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran tells Musa to speak to Fir'aun, Musa is not allowed to say, oh, you know, they're, you know, Fir'aun is condemned. There's no, there's no point in talking to him. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells Musa, speak to him with gentle words, meaning the heart of Fir'aun has not yet been condemned. So, khatam Allahu ala qulubihim. That is basically a judgment that's being passed on a soul, on a heart, and because only God. That is only the domain of God to, 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 to pass official judgment on the heart. It's, it's ascribed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So would it be accurate to say that what, if a person does an action on their own, like with their own free will, that action is attri uh, attributed to themselves? <laughs> but if there are consequences of their actions, which are not might not necessarily be intended, but... Those actions have consequences. Those consequences get attributed to Allah. Exactly. Exactly. All right, thank you.